Tonight we're going to learn about magic runes. They're also kind of like uh, uh, runic yoga, something like this, like Gnostic yoga almost. is exactly kind of what we use them for, like yoga practices. Um, all, all the body positions correspond to a specific rune letter, and we'll get into it in a moment. I thought, you know, might as well start with audience participation. From previous lectures, remember we talked a lot about three brain, the three brains? I just wondered if anyone wanted to shout out what those three brains, the three centers are, just take a stab up there. You're not being tested right now. Intellectual, that's one, yep, the intellectual center. Emotional. Emotional, yep. And I heard the other one's on the motor. And the motor, three. That's okay, so perfect. So, so those are the three centers. Uh, when you're meditating, what are we trying to do? We're trying to bring those three centers into harmony or balance. We're trying to control those three centers. So um, the emotional center can be more difficult to control because sometimes we don't know why we're feeling the way we're feeling and we, it just comes over us. We don't know what we can do to get out of it. But what we can control more easily is the intellectual and the motor. So that's why before you meditate, you sit down, you take a comfortable position, you relax the body, try and control the motor center. And then you focus on your breathing, you focus on a mantra, you focus on one thing, try and control the intellectual center. <coughs> Same is true for when we work with these magic runes. But instead of relaxing the body, now we're holding it in a specific position, like a, like a yoga move. So this, but the, all the same uh, factors apply. We're, we're, we're using it like a meditation. And uh, they have specific properties and powers that we're going to get into. And so let's get into it. A judo of the spirit exists. We are referring to the runic exercises. These are formidable in order to attain the awakening of the consciousness. So these practices, they're, they're just as important as meditation. They can help us as much as meditation. And they have uh, some different properties that are, that are very beneficial to us when we practice with them daily. So we'll, we'll see that there, there, are, there are a lot of runes and a lot of runic positions. Uh, Master Samuel, he, he only teaches specific ones. <coughs> we're gonna, I think we're going to look at 11 today, and then there's going to be a few more, maybe three or four more that are taught at a later date, more of the advanced rooms that, that uh, have more uh, moving components to it. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about the sacred fire. So all of the multiplicity of divine powers enter into activity with the ascension of the sacred fire along the medulla canal, along the spine. The sacred fire is the transmuted sexual energy. A fundamental clue in order to awaken the sacred fire, the kundalini, is hidden within sex. The refrained desire will make the sexual energy flow inward and upward towards the brain. So the sacred fire, sometimes called the divine spark, that that divine peace that's inside of us. It's not the soul, but it's the material that the soul can be created from, the material that the higher bodies can be created from, like the uh, astral body and so forth. And uh, this, it comes up a lot in uh, these teachings, the sacred fire, the kundalini. We, we talked about it rising the energy up the spine. As it, uh, as it rises up the spine, it calls into action the different chakras. It starts rotating the chakras from the lowest up to the highest. So the pranayama, the hamsa, and kandil, bandil are, those are our three practices that we use working with the sacred fire or for transmutation. The pranayama, remember it's the alternate nose breathing. The hamsa, I believe we did it last week, the, and you might have done it before with Lee. Yeah, breathing in mentally, saying ham, and then sa. Kandil Bondil R is a, is a mantra. I don't know if you guys have been told this mantra. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it, it's a powerful mantra. It's important. It was one that was actually unveiled by Samael on War, where a lot of the mantras where you, uh, we, they're, they're older in origin. They have like Sanskrit origin or Buddhist or Tibetan. But this one was actually delivered by him himself to us. These are all for working with the sacred fire, for transmuting the sexual energies into that force that can rise the spine called the kundalini. <coughs> so the first runic position that we're going to look at is called the rune fa. 
Fa is the rune of light. It produces great spiritual strength. It brings us inner peace, mental serenity, and it serves as a special help for the awakening of the consciousness. Pranayama, prayer, meditation, and a specific sacred posture exists within this room. The magical science of breath, the pranayama, or the hamsa, when combined with meditation, permits us to utilize certain sparks, flashes, flames of the kundalini for the purpose of attaining the awakening of the consciousness. So even if we don't have that serpent raised all the way to the brain, even if we, we're not sure exactly what this talk is about this kundalini or the serpent, um, by doing certain practices, we can use a, an amount of that energy that we have. We can use an amount of it to help us further progress and awakening of the consciousness, like to help us in our remember our dreams, to help us try and self-observe, to help us uh, uh, just live our day, day with more consciousness, that kind of thing, so we can be more aware of our surroundings. We don't have to have the this kundalini risen to be able to work with some of its properties. Yes? So would we uh, do this posture while doing, say, a hamsa meditation? or? In the next couple of slides, it's going to get all clear. Oh, okay. We're going to run through it, and then, yep, but basically, yeah, you're going to be taking that posture and mm -hmm. saying specific mantras and oh, okay. visualizing specific things to get right. the most out of these, the most benefit. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if, or if you were there at, um, our, at in Arva, we did we did yeah, a yeah. bunch of these rooms. Yeah. The time you might have thought, what, what the heck are these guys doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now you know it's just a more advanced practice. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very it's very similar to meditation. We use it the same way as we use meditation, only it's slightly different. Because instead of relaxing the body, we're holding it in a specific position to attract specific forces. Is the idea mm -hmm. exactly like yoga, okay. <laughs> which everyone is familiar with? I think. Yeah. So Master Samael in his book, uh, Runic Magic, teaches us the, the following practice for this room. We must greet each new day with immense joy, getting up from bed, raise the arms towards the Christ Son in such a way that the left arm is a bit more elevated than the right. The palms of the hands should remain still before the light in the attitude of one who really longs to receive the solar rays. So this is what, what he says. We should, we should, when we stand up, we hold it there, and... and uh, he, he said, suggested maybe we should do it when we get out of bed, which is a good time to do it. Um, and that we should stand, bef so we should be facing east if we're standing before the light. Uh, and we, it, it's important to take a, like a mystical attitude or try to connect with a more spiritual part of yourself when you do these practices, I guess, or the attitude of one who really longs to receive the solar rays. So then, while you're picturing that, we next, we work with the transmutation, inhaling through the nose and exhaling the air through the mouth in a rhythmic way. This is also a, a form of pranayama or transmutation. It's the complete breath that we teach before we start meditation. Yes? If you're indoors, should you be in front of a window or does it matter if there's a wall on the east side? It, it doesn't It doesn't really matter, but if, if you're near a window, it, it's, it's easier, better, it's right? easier to visualize the solar forces coming in and you can almost visualize it easier you can feel it inside oh, almost yeah. easier. Mm -hmm. so but don't let not being near a window be the deciding factor but if you can like I saw down on the farm we we did them outdoors because mm -hmm. to get the most benefit from this the solar atoms so now after you breathe deep the complete breath got into that mystical attitude that connection with that Divine Mother, or whatever spiritual, whatever can get you into a spiritual state of mind. Then you imagine the light of the Christ Son enters into us through the fingers, circulating through the arms and flooding our entire organism until it reaches the consciousness, stimulating it, awakening it, and calling it into activity. So this room, on the previous uh, slide, you've seen I said that, uh, there's prayer involved in it, there's meditation, there's pranayama. There's also visualization. So now you're standing there, you have your eyes closed. If you're near a window or outside, then it is easier to visualize that this Christ sun or these solar atoms are entering 
into you. But the visualization is important. Because if you can visualize it, if you can emerge as much as your senses into it as possible, the more benefit you'll receive from it. Because you're less distracted from everything else. You're focusing more of your attention on exactly what you're doing. And in this way, it's also kind of a practice for your concentration, visualization. So we know that visualization, it, it, is a, it has real power. And it's not just this group that says that. Lots of, every New Age group out there is saying visualization has power. The, the secret is a big one, you visualize it. Visualization does have power. And, uh, the more you use it, the more you will realize this for yourself. The more you visualize, the more you work on being able to see in your mind's eye what you're doing, the, the, the benefits will become increased. And you'll, your ability to visualize will be increased. Just like working out any other part of you, like, like working out your muscles, you get stronger. Same, with, same way with this. By working with visualization, your meditations become stronger. You can reach deeper states through continued practice. Next, we recite the following. Marvelous forces of love enliven my sacred fires so that my consciousness may awaken. And then we repeat this mantra, all uh, in separate breaths. Fa, fe, fi, fo, fu, to work the specific chakras. So th this rune is excellent for the amount of visualization and the amount of, uh, the, just the ability that you have you can, to really surround yourself in this particular room, to shut out the outside world. So the room fa helps us to use the fire, the light of the kundalini energy in a positive manner to assist us in transforming the subconscious into the conscious. This is kind of important to remember. Sometimes you read the books or you hear us, talking about light versus darkness and all these really mystical and esoteric sounding terms. There's practical terms too. What are we trying to do by awakening the consciousness? We're trying to understand the subconscious. We're trying to realize what, what is driving us to do the things that we're doing. We can understand portions of the subconscious if we analyze it. Because how we live our lives is, if it, pretend this is a line here, underneath is the subconscious, Here's the conscious. This is what we experience in our daily life. Under here you have egos, thoughts, desires, all fighting and quarreling. Every once in a while one will rise above the subconscious and that's what we'll feel. Oh, I'm hungry. I should go and get a food. Oh, remember when that person years ago said that to me? I'm still mad about that. But we will see what it is that's driving those thoughts or those desires at that particular moment. But if we analyze them, we can. So it's, it's not totally esoteric and mystical, it's practical too. Many psychologists became famous by trying to study the subconscious. That's what we're trying to do too. We don't need to go to school or get a degree to study the subconscious, you have one. You can study it for yourself. Maybe you can get more out of it than reading about what someone else decided when they studied it. That, that's a big thing in these teachings. Figure out our motives. If we figure out our motives, we can be more honest with ourselves. The more that you become conscious, the more objective you can be about your surroundings and people around you. Um, and to be objective is something that is very lacking in, in society in general. If, if someone said to you, you're a liar, you would be very offended. You'd be, I'm not a liar, and this is why I'm not a liar. And you give all your points and reasons that you had. You had but if you were objectively observed, well, why did they say that I was a liar in the first place? And then you, and then, then you observe the scene, did I lie to them? And if you did lie to them, then you'll say, well, maybe they had the right to say I was a liar. Or if you didn't lie to them, then you would say, well, this person is mistaken, and, and their view on life is skewed. So maybe the problem is theirs and not mine. So I don't know why I should let it affect the, the well-being of my mind. This kind of thing. The next rune is the rune R. The mantra Ario prepares a Gnostic for the advent of the sacred fire. This mantra must be chanted every morning, dividing it into three syllables. A, ri, o. Prolong the sound of each letter. 
it is advisable to work with this practice for 10 minutes daily. So the purpose of this practice is to prepare, to pray, prayer, for, to, to prepare the Nasik for the advent of the sacred fire, for the rising of the Kundalini, or for the awakening of the Kundalini. It's to prepare the body, to prepare the mind, to get it into a state that's more harmonious and, and more conducive to the awakening of the Kundalini. It doesn't raise the Kundalini for you, it doesn't do that, but, but it does help you to prepare. So this is why he says it's, it's advisable for us to work with it 10 minutes daily. Because, and many of us, we haven't risen this Kundalini. All of us. So we're all on the path trying to do this. <coughs> this helps us just to prepare for that. The Rune Kaum. The reason why I started with these three particular ones is because they're all, these three runes all relate to the sacred fire. They're all relating to that topic. So the practice of this rune should be done before the sexual transmutation. It is for married or for single people. For the practice of the rune column, the Gnostic student should stand up straight facing the east with the arms raised as in the picture. Breathe rhythmically and vocalize the mantra column like this. With the daily practice of this rune, the sexual energy is channeled in the proper way, up to the brain and then to the heart. To clarify, the runic exercise is one thing, and the sexual transmutation is another, and they should not be confused. So what does this rune help us to do? If we do this rune before we do a transmutation exercise, like a pranayama or the hamsa, this, just, this helps us to utilize those energies better. It's like an assisting. It's like an assistant. It helps us to, to, to really get the most benefit that we can out of the transmutation practice. But it's not really the transmutation itself. It's separate. It's like a preliminary. Right? If the transmutation is the 100 meter sprint, this is all the stretches and jumping jacks you do before. <laughs> that kind of idea. Now we're going to talk about the Divine Mother. As a few of these runes, um, they relate the Divine Mother or the Divine Feminine. Each person has their own individual Divine Mother. The Divine Mother is the intelligent force called Kundalini. In order for us to eliminate an ego, we must first comprehend it, then we must ask the Divine Mother to destroy it. Without her assistance, the disintegration of the I is not possible. So this is important to remember. For, for all of us, where we are now, the Divine Mother is that closest connection we have to the spiritual realm. She, she resides in the heart. She assists us daily. As we grow on the path, our understanding of certain concepts also grow. We can see her as, as a physical entity separate from ourselves. We can gather more information and more experience and realize maybe she's an energetic force that we carry within ourselves, a principle, an intelligent principle. I remember when I was sitting down here and listening up here, I was always confused. It was like, everything is the Kundalini? The sacred fire is the Kundalini? The Divine Mother is the Kundalini? What, what's not the Kundalini? <laughs> so, right, it was kind of confusing that way. So the sacred fire is, is, is the Kundalini. It's the energy itself. The Divine Mother is the intelligent principle that guides that for us. She's the one who offer, operates it for us. The spiritual part of ourselves that operates it in a correct manner. So... The sexual energies, we know that they can be used to create or to destroy. We can create, with sexual energy, we can create another physical human being. You know this? Or we can create, if we use it internally instead of outwardly, we can create solar bodies, the higher bodies, with the sexual energy. Or we can also use the sexual energy to destroy. We can use that energy to destroy egos. That psychic energy. It's a force and a principle, and we can use it to understand these psycho psychological aggregates. That we've comprehended them, but then to eliminate them fully, we have to give ourselves over to a power greater than ourselves. We have to pray to this force to eliminate it for us. This is why in many religions, many religions, there is always a, a divine feminine figure. Always a divine feminine. And it's always very important. 
I, I have noticed that in Christianity, uh, the longer we go from Roman Catholicism, the less and less it seems they put importance on figures like the Divine Mother or, or the saints or something like this. But that's, it, it, it's very important and it should be remembered. This is an actual, she, like, this is an actual contact that you can have. If you're through your day and you find yourself you're just mad, you don't know why, and everything, everything's irritating, you can take them in. You can breathe in. You can visualize your heart. You can see through your practice of visualization a heart temple. You can connect with a spiritual principle that exists within you. It's called the Divine Mother. This can help you. This can center you, ground you, help you to break the negative influence of whatever mood you're under. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> yes, that's good. So please eat. There's lots of food. <laughs> and it's interesting to see the Divine Mother in many cultures and in many religions. She's always holding the solar child, right? Yep. Horus. Yep. So, what, what does that represent? It's a divine child that's from a virgin birth, or yes. Our consciousness, or mm -hmm. our higher being. Yep. Exactly. If um, if she's a symbol of the intelligent principle, the guiding force of the Kundalini, this child is the Christ force that we can incarnate through using the divine mother, the feminine principle. What is that? That's raising the Kundalini, using it to build solar bodies and incarnate higher principles, high to incarnate the Christ force or a solar force. Another way of saying, because when we say Christ, we always immediately picture Jesus. But we, we have to remember that it's an actual cosmic force. This is why the Divine Mother is always holding the Christ child. Because only through her can this child come into existence in us. You see? So this art has deeper, deeper esoteric meanings. And this is why it's universal to all different religions who are separated by continents and oceans and everything else. So it's interesting. For us, where we are now, it's important to know that if we can think of the Divine Mother through our day, if we, if we can feel ourselves being overtaken by a specific ego, right then and there we can ask her, Divine Mother, please take this ego from me. That's a practice of what we call the death in motion, death from moment to moment, to realizing that a specific ego is working through us and then stopping it right there. Remember Lee, would probably, you might remember, he gave a, they always gave the same stories, but the story of the tree with the roots and the little hairs on the roots, did they give you this story? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, the death in motion, doing that, Divine Mother, please help me overcome this ego of pride that I'm feeling right now. That is the, that's the act of cutting these fine hairs from the roots so that we don't feed that ego. So it's important to destroy egos. It's also important not to create any more, any more egos. And it's also important not to strengthen the ones that we've already created. This is why there are all these practices. So the room we will look at is the rune East. The mantra for the rune East, when repeated, gives us the Egyptian name of the Divine Mother, Isis. This practice helps us to connect with that part of our being that guides us and works for us in this path. In this rooted position, the student is, attract, is acting like an antenna to attract cosmic forces. So this, this, this runic position is dedicated to the Divine Mother. Yep. The practice helps us connect with that part of our being that guides us and works for us in the path. She's that, she is that, the, the, the Jiminy Cricket, the, the voice of reason in the back of our minds who's trying to speak to us and sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't. She's the intuition. So it's very important to remember, to remember her throughout our day and throughout our work because that can keep us grounded in our day and keep us grounded in trying to take some of this stuff that we learn here and using it out there where it matters. It's very here. It, it's, it's pretty simple to be a Gnostic here because you're all sitting there facing here. You have to, you have to listen to me because I'm the guy standing up here and talking. <laughs> but to take this stuff out there is, is the challenge. So even, even uh, Samael tells a story about he was astral projecting in the higher realms. He went to enter a temple. There are temples that exist up there. He went to enter one, and the, the guard at the door said, "You can't enter because uh, you can't enter because you've been. I, I, 
a bad son, a bad child, and you've forgotten your mother, something along these lines. And he was very perplexed. He was, he was quite removed from his physical earth. Mother, he hadn't seen her in a long time. He thought, spent that night in the astral trying to locate where his earthly mother was. And he found her, but he couldn't understand. He didn't understand what he was supposed to do by finding her, what it meant, until he realized that they were talking about the specific part inside of us, that his internal mother, his divine mother, well, even him, he had already been quite advanced in the past. He'd had astral experiences in this, and he didn't know this secret about remembering the Divine Mother. It's very important. That's why at home, if you're just trying to practice meditation and you want to try and become a little bit more uh, intuitive, it's a pretty popular mantra. Sit there and relax, breathe, and then, oh, this works the heart chakra. This works your connection with the Divine Mother. So, certain things are important to remember, and the Divine Mother is definitely one of those things. So standing in a straight position, let us raise our arms in order to form a straight line with the whole body. And after praying and asking for help to our Divine Mother, we must sing the mantra, Isis, as follows. Isis. Is prolonging the sound of the two letters and divided the word into two syllables. Afterward, the student must lay down with his, his or her relaxed body and filled with ecstasy must concentrate and meditate on the Divine Mother. This is a good practice. It is good to recognize those forces that are inside of us, to venerate them when we can. It strengthens them and helps us in our work help the work to become easier, and we might be able to verify, which is the main goal here, is to verify for ourselves. The next room that we will look at is also uh, related to the Divine Mother. That is the room Ur. With this room, one will attain peace, health, strength, and harmony in accordance with the law of karma. This room is very appropriate for all those who truly love their Divine Mother. Through this room, we venerate that superior force that exists within us, the Kundalini. So the practice much similar. It's, it's very similar to Isis, except for it has a very long prayer that goes with it. So loving our Divine Mother and thinking of that great womb in which the worlds are gestated, we pray like this. Inside my eternal real being resides the Divine Light. Ramio is the mother of my being. Devi Kundalini. And then we mantralize Ram Yo. Assist me. Ramio, help me. Ramio, enlighten me. Ramio is my divine mother. O oh, Isis mine, you have the child Horus, my true being, in your arms. I need to die in myself so that my essence may be lost in him. Him. This is a prayer whose sole purpose is to venerate the Divine Mother, to strengthen the connection, so that maybe throughout the day, that voice, that Jiminy Cricket consciousness voice, maybe it's a little louder, and it's harder for us to ignore, and we have to just pause and listen. Uh, what am I doing right now? Should I be doing what I'm doing, or should I be listening to this part of myself that's speaking to me? Or should I ignore it like I've done in the past? Or It's a pretty strong prayer, and Ramio is another name for the Divine Mother, and that's why they use it as a, like a mantric name. Next is one that you're familiar with already from other practices, the Rune Sig. Remember when we do the circle and we close it, the Rune Sig, do it after a lot of practices. It's also related to the powers of the Divine Mother. So Sig is, a, Sig is the secret name of the sacred, frightful viper Kundalini. Its symbol is the divine lightning bolt. To practice, you must seal all of your magical works, invocations, supplications, healing, chains, etc. with the rune zig. The zigzag of lightning must be traced with your hand in your extended index finger at the moment when you also sound the letter s. So this rune is, is, is more like a command or an asking of whatever, whatever work we were we were doing to let it be fulfilled 
like saying, let it be filled, fulfilled, let it be realized, let it be done. So it's, it's like us asking the Divine Mother to make it so, to add strength to the practice that we are doing. Next we will talk about consciousness. So the psyche is divided into three main parts. Anyone want to take a stab at these three main parts? The past, the psyche. You, you just take a shout out if you want. Anyone have the <laughs> the motor, intellectual, and uh, wow, yeah, those are the three brains. Yep, but we're talking about the psyche now. Oh, I know it's, it's three this and three that and five this, and it's hard to keep it keep it all straight. But what we're talking about here is the essence, oh, okay. the ego, and the personality. So that's what the psyche is divided. In. We must increase consciousness by eliminating the ego. We do not possess a definitive individuality. We are a psychological multiplicity, a sum of eyes. So this will be more familiar from the previous lectures about the ego, the sum of eyes, and so the essence. Does anyone take a shot at that? And what is that? Remember they said that maybe we have three percent of it, and ninety percent ego. The essence is it's like that divine spark, that part of the source that we have in, in us, that psychic material that we can use to create the solar bodies, to raise the kundalini. It's, it is like saying the consciousness, that, that which comprehends. The ego we're, we're pretty familiar with at this point, it's the psychological aggregates, the desires, the faults that we may, we may have created through our wrong actions or our skewed vision on the world and others around us. And the personality can be a little tricky to understand for some, especially if anyone's done psychology majors. And there's been some psychology majors that came through here and they had to say, what are you talking about with this personality? It's not what they teach at all. Because what we teach all three of this, they, they think that's all the personality. The personality are those like environmental factors that make you who you are. Like the region you're born into will have an effect on the way you think, the family you're born into, the religion you're born into, the circumstances of your childhood, whether you're rich or poor, these are all have an effect on how you view the world. Those are what go into creating the personality. The personality dies with the physical body. It's, it's, it's of time. So it doesn't carry on. It doesn't get too uh, reincorporated into another body. Like I... It's kind of interesting, There's, you have friends and, and they stereotype themselves, like, like I have an Irish friend and he says he loves to drink Guinness and fight, because he's Irish, and that's what we are, I'm Irish, this is what I do. <laughs> so he's saying because he's Irish, this is how he acts. So there, he's, he's allowing an outside fact to determine parts of the way he views the world, that, as an example. <laughs> so. To help the consciousness, the rune tear is used to activate the consciousness, to awaken it from uh, that state of sleep. It is used to stimulate and to increase the amount of consciousness we have, which is currently bottled up in the ego. So this is, a, as you recall, you eliminate the ego, you free the consciousness. What, is, what does that mean? Does that, it means you understand what is motivating you to do a certain thing. You can understand why it is you've been driven to do that, you can change your, the, why you, you can change your action. You don't have to be driven mechanically. You don't have to let others tell you how you're going to act by responding to if they insult you, being offended, or if they praise you, feeling pride. You don't have to mechanically respond. You can respond in a deeper way, obje an objective way. So this room is used to like impact the consciousness, like wake it up. Like grab it and shake it so that you can use it for a moment. So you can use it in your practice, so you can use it in your daily life. So the practice. The practice corresponding to the room tier, sometimes it's spelled like this or, or like this, you'll find, consists of placing the arms high above the head, then descending them to the sides while the hands are cupped. When lowering the straight arms, pronounce the mantra, tear. And you... Uh, you strongly pronounce the T, and that gets the consciousness into activity. <laughs> yeah. Like a shock, like a shock wave to your consciousness. 
So the, the letter T strikes the consciousness in order to awaken it. The letter I works within the blood, which is the vehicle of the essence. The R, while intensifying the circulation of the blood in the veins and in the vessels, operates marvels with the internal energies by intensifying and stimulating the awakening. So this mantra is meant to call your body into more action, to, to move the blood through your veins so that your consciousness may be more stimulated. The next rune is the rune bar. You see with these runes here, you're standing here, you're actually making the letter B with your body. The rune bar is the symbol of the incarnated Christ force. So Christ, as we explained just briefly earlier, Christ is not a human nor a divine individual. Christ is a title given to all fully realized masters. So there's been more than one Christ on this earth. There's been many Christs. It's like there's been more than one Buddha. There's been many Buddhas. It's like a level that one has attained. The rune bar is combined with the rune tier. So we used the previous rune that we explained for the impact of the consciousness. We combined it with this rune to make a super rune. <laughs> the objective of this practice is to wisely mix within our in interior uh, universe, the magical forces of both these runes, to awaken the consciousness and to intimately accumulate Christic atoms of high voltage. So just like in the rune fall, when you're standing there and you're imagining all these Christic forces coming into your body, that's also the purpose of this rune, to gather this Christic force, this, this force, this higher vibration, so that your, your consciousness, your body, you're more conducive, you're, you're more able to meditate, you're more able to, to keep that state throughout your day, which is very difficult. Just to remember, uh, self-remembering, to like walk around throughout the day and, and just try to remember that there are spiritual parts of yourself so that hopefully by doing that you can objectively view the situations you're in. You can even judge yourselves uh, more according to how life is actually unfolding instead of just the way that you see yourselves. So the practice. It is recommended to practice this uh, practice with this rune, tear, uh, which constitutes the fusion of fire and water, birth and life. So after performing the rune tear, we combine it with the rune bar, placing the right arm with the right leg at the same time, recline slightly the left leg and place the left hand on the waist and pronounce the mantra bar. Like, bar. You'll see, sometimes in the pictures it's shown on the left side, but sometimes we do them on the, the right side. Same in all war on this. Something that says which, which way you face or which way you do it isn't as important as doing it. So sometimes people get caught in like when you're tracing the circle, is it that way or, or is it that way when I do the cross in the circle? That it's one of those things that if you're not sure which way to do it, it, it doesn't have a negative impact to do it the opposite way. That's not so true for the visualization of the which way the chakras rotate, but but for like doing some of these practices, if if you stand this way or this way, it's not going to negatively or positively impact it, as long as you do it. And also with the runes too, I don't think I wrote it in this slide, but if you wanted to practice the runes, it, sometimes it's better just to just pick two or three and do them repeatedly, like three, seven times, and do them well. Focus all your attention and energy on them, rather than running through the whole list, trying to get through them all and doing them all kind of wishy-washy. Same, same with like meditation, yeah. How many are there? Well, there's 11 that we're going to learn today, and then there's a few more that are more, even more advanced that you'll learn. So I think, so. But it's just, it's just like, like how many mantras are there? There's tons. You don't have to use every single one of them. If you have an affinity with certain ones, then use them. There's so many practices because the idea is to get you to, to verify these things for yourself, to find the practices that work the best with you, to experiment to experiment and find those ones that you have an affinity with. 
That's all I can tell you that you have to do this one at 7.30 and then the one before it has to be done directly after. There's nothing like that. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the rune Dorn. Dorn or sometimes Thorn. Maybe you remember these are, these are, yeah, these are all from the Nordic alphabet. The rune Dorn is used to cultivate willpower. It is of great assistance in helping us to increase our conscious efforts in the work. The rune torn is also a powerful mantra for avoiding the sexual fall or spilling of the energies. So this, this rune deals with willpower. So this, this one is a, it's a strong one and it, it helps you if you're just um, starting out maybe and you want to get into a routine but you don't find the time and oh, I got all these other things to do. This one helps you to develop the willpower, which is one thing that we need to develop. We need to develop a taste for the work, they call it, <laughs> so that we enjoy doing meditation. We enjoy the time that we take to connect with those more spiritual faculties of ourselves. Because if we enjoy it, then we'll do it more. Then it'll be a routine, and then we'll get the most benefit from it. So right now, everybody struggles with willpower. When you first start a thing, it's very, it's very easy because you're excited about it, you get right into it, you, you jump into it, and then after a time you'll notice, this is true for everybody, the excitement starts to leave and then you, you might still want, and, and for anything, not just narcissism, it could be for playing golf, anything you start, any new activity, it's very easy to do it at first, and then over time, it becomes difficult. By using this mantra, this rune, we help to strengthen the willpower, which is which is very important, because there there is times when we don't. Oh, it's, this is overwhelming. I don't want to do this. I don't. What they're talking about? How many mountains and cylinders and bodies and whatever? <laughs> and how? What what are they talking about? This is so much. <laughs> well, you increase the willpower, and you start just just doing the, some of the practices. You you have a small verification here that leads you to go on. And I say, oh, there is something to what they're teaching us. There is, there is benefit to doing these. They aren't just telling me to do these practices for no reason. They're telling me that I should consider doing them because they've done them and it worked for them. Willpower will help us immensely. So practice for the rune dorn. In the military position, on our feet, firm and facing towards the east, Place your right arm in such a way that your hand will remain resting upon your waist or hips, thus performing uh, the form of this rune. Now you must sing the mantra syllables ta, te, ti, to, tu, with the purpose of developing in yourself Christ's will. This exercise must be practiced every day at sunrise. Is that a hard and fast rule? No. You don't have, you can practice it whenever you want. At sunrise, there are certain forces, there's so certain vibrations that, that make this rune easier to practice. It might make you have slightly more benefit from it. But if you can't do it at sunrise, say, oh, I can't, I can't do it at sunrise, so I uh, forget it. Do it whenever you can. Same with any of these. Do them whenever you can. Find a way to work them into your schedule. Not just runes, but meditation, self-observation. Work it into your routine, and then it becomes easier when you make it easier, then it helps to build the willpower, and then you can continue on, and then you'll have verifications. And that's, that's the main goal. Every day at sunrise. Next we're going to talk about karma. Does anybody recognize who this picture is? Anubis. Yep, the chief judge of karma. The law of cause and effect. That's a very simplified version of what karma is. This concept is, is really well understood in the East. And in the West, we have a vague understanding of maybe what we think it might mean. But there, they, 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 there are many schools that are devoted strictly to studying karma as, as deeply and fully as they can. So the law of karma is related with the laws of return and currents and evolution and involution. We know that it's very intimately related to returning uh, recurrence. Because why do we return? Why do these events occur? 
because we're paying karma, because we haven't learned what it is we were supposed to learn from them in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's why it reoccurs. That's the recurrence. Why do we return to a physical body? We still have karma to pay. We're, we're here in the physical world. We have a physical body. Well, that's a sign that we may have karmic debts, that we do have karmic debts, or else we wouldn't need to be in this form. When we experience something, and say we learn from it finally, oh, you know, a little switch goes on and, and mm -hmm. we change that. Too. So the next time, if you do come, you're not going to have to go through that experience anymore, will you? Because right. you, you've learned from it. Right. On a deeper level. On a deeper level. Yeah. If it was to, like, another way of explaining would be like, what is it that attracts the karma? What is it that, that receives the judgment of the karma? It's the ego. You eliminate the ego, you eliminate the need to be karmically balanced for creating that ego in the first place. Because that's another thing about karma. It's not, it's not bad. It's not like we're being morally punished for doing the wrong thing. It's also like a law of balance. The pendulum swings so far this way, it has to swing this way. So if you're driving and driving for a certain desire and a pleasure, and you reach it, that's good, you have it momentarily, but the pendulum will also swing in the opposite direction with the same force. Right? The law of cause and effect. That's what we're talking about. That's, this is what karma is. We also know, or it's been taught that various types of karmas exist. You know, anyone recalls any of those, I believe it was in a lecture that Lee gave. Could have been in phase A or B, I'm not sure. Anyone remember the different types of karma? A few. D Dharma is like the opposite of karma. That's like, okay, yeah. like we have credit with the law. Yeah. So it's like if we did something bad, then we could pay off our karma with the Dharma or the good right. deeds we've done. Or if we don't have that Dharma or credit built up, then we pay in what we, what we view as pain or suffering only because it's our ego or our image of ourself that suffers. Not so much like an objectively we're being punished by God for being immoral or anything like this. Various types of karma. There's individual karma. So the individual Only gathers those. karma. Yep. Family karma. Family karma. Family karma. Yep. Group. Group karma. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Nations. 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 Yeah. Nations. Yeah. World karma. Uh, the karma of the gods, which is like a spirit form of karma. So even the higher beings, they have karma to pay. And there's also kar karma say is what is uh, the karma acquired through sexual uniting of a male and female. So okay. you can you can occur karma. Like sh it's like sharing of karma. So mm -hmm. if you have a partner and you sh can share their karma. If you have lots of partners then you share lots of karma. <laughs> it's not. It's nothing immoral. I'm it's not, the nothing to be scared. Of. It's just this is a Keep form of karma. karma. To yourself, I want dharma. <laughs> so it, it exists. And yeah, you don't think of that though. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. It's like sharing each other. You're sharing each other's energies. You're sharing each other's something intimate, personal with each other. You also would, share karma. Would that be? Uh, uh, one of the explanations why when two people are together for a long time and married or not, uh, they become more like each other, they pick up on each other's person, you know, yeah, quirks yeah, I know and everything, yeah. you know? Yeah, it could possibly be sharing of karma or yeah. being around the person, yeah. And they become more and more like the other one. That is true, that happens. That happens almost universally. <laughs> Hopefully we pick up the good traits of our, of our <laughs> partner. <laughs> so we say, uh, if you see some uh, good trait in a person, try to emulate it in yourself. And if you see a negative trait in a person, try to eliminate that trait from yourself. That's right. Because right? <laughs> people are like a mirror to us. That's Whatever right. exists in them, it exists in us too. It might be a more <coughs> refined version or a little subtler. It might be harder to find. But we have, we have it on some level. Mm -hmm. We might have it exactly or even worse than they have it, and we don't even see it because we're not viewing ourselves objectively. Which is difficult to do. Some people... Uh, I can't exactly remember all of Lee's lecture on karma, but karma is negotiable, and the judges of the law will grant credit to those who request it. So this is another interesting fact, that it's negotiable, and that we can do certain mantras and practices to try and negotiate karma. These practices are, are very serious, and they carry with them more consequences, but we will look at, at that.
the masters of karma reside in the sixth dimension, oh. in the castle plane. Oh, I thought that was the fifth. No, the sixth. The castle plane is the. Uh, it's kind of easy to remember because it's like uh, law of karma is cause and effect. The castle plane is the causal plane, the plane where cause happens. So. And that's where the ego doesn't exist anymore. Just, just the the very yeah, the very seeds of the ego, just the very its first emanation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But not not nearly as strong or as. That's as right. Here. The fifth would be the emotional and the intellectual center. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, yeah. the fifth plane can be like the astral slash mental. Center. Yeah. Yeah. So the mind and the. So karma is negotiable, and that's one thing that some people get interested in. Uh, well, that's good. Now I can just ask them, hey, can you just forgive me for these things I've done? Or I really, say you really need assistance. Sometimes it's not even for yourself personally, it's for somebody else. You can, you can request credit. You can do certain practices, certain mantras that, that will uh, allow you to receive a credit on karma. Say... Please help me with blank, and if you do, I promise that I will blank, like this. And uh, the more serious thing that you promise to do, like if you're a heavy smoker and you say, I promise I will quit smoking, something that's difficult for you, then the better chances are of this being fulfilled. But also, you have to be prepared because it has to be something that you can do. You have to be able to quit smoking. Or else, if you can't, or if you go back on the credit that you've been given, the karma can hit you stronger. That's yeah. the idea. Just like using a credit card, it feels like free money at the time. <laughs> so those practices are more serious, and but we'll, we'll we'll teach one. Before we do that, we'll look at the rune Rita, taking the position Rita, the letter. R, taking the position of an R with your body. The rune Rita has the power to activate the internal conscience. It allows us to free that part of our consciousness that we call self-judgment. This tool is useful for understanding karma that has been acquired and for allowing us to work with repentance. This one, and there's many Gnostic students who practice this one and, and they all speak for how well it works. The ability, and it, it's good to practice early on to free your ability to self-judgment, to objectively see yourself as you are, to see your surroundings, your cir circumstances as they actually happen, not as how you thought they happened through your, your view that might be skewed by many things like pride or self-love or all these things that we have that everyone has. So this is this is a strong key that can help us to actual progress, actually progress the rune Rita to free self-judgment. Often, and it's been said before, like we will, we will criticize our neighbors to no end for anything, anything they do. And if we do the same thing, well, well, no, I, I have these reasons. And it, it's good to practice early on to free your ability to self-judgment, to objectively see yourself as you are, to see your surroundings, your cir circumstances as they actually happen, not as how you thought they happened through your, your view that might be skewed by many things like pride or self-love or all these things that we have that everyone has. So. This is, this is a strong key that can help us to actual progress, actually progress the rune Rita, to free self-judgment. Often, and it's been said before, like we will, we will criticize our neighbors to no end for anything, anything they do. And if we do the same thing, well, well no, I, I have these reasons for doing This is why I did it. I mean, I'm not like... You know, we let ourselves off so easy, and we're so hard on those around us. Even, maybe not, maybe we don't vocalize it, but mentally, we think it. We judge them for small things that we ourselves do, but we let ourselves off the hook for. So this isn't like we're not trying to bring ourselves down and say, oh, I should judge myself harder because I'm a terrible person inside. This just lets <laughs> us view how does the ego work? How does it hide itself 
it's like how does our subconscious work? How does it, how does it mask itself that we think we're justified to do something that we condemn another to do? This is this is practical. This is this is the practical teachings in everyday life. Because to do these rooms, to meditate, to attend the lectures, this is all good. This all strengthens the work, the path. But but the real work is out there, isn't it? In life, that's where that's where the actual work is. That's where we can learn the most. It's important to meditate, and it's important to do all these other things, but it's also important to observe ourselves, how we act around others who are, uh, they're just like us, really. They act, they're from the same areas we're from, they have similar circumstances. Why do we act towards them the way we do? And it helps us to work with, okay, I'll throw another number out there, <laughs> the three factors. Does anyone remember these three main factors? Birth. The death, oh, birth, death, and sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> birth, death, death, and sacrifice. The birth, what are we, the birth of what? Consciousness. Consciousness, yeah. The birth of the consciousness. The birth of the solar bodies. The birth of the spiritual qualities. And the death. Yeah. That's one that I guess we kind of hammer home around here. <laughs> death of the ego. Yes. <laughs> or at least to comprehend it, to understand it. And then see for yourself if what we're saying has any basis. And the third one is sacrifice. What is that? That's a sacrifice for others. How, how do we sacrifice for others? This is difficult. This is difficult to understand or think about. How do we sacrifice for others in a way that helps them? By teaching. Yeah, this is, sure, it's a sacrifice. You're sacrificing yourself. Yeah, yeah, but there's other ways. Like before, even, you don't have to be a Gnostic instructor or anything. You don't have to, you don't even have to tell. Everyone, you know, you don't have to go out and spread this teachings because it's nothing like that. To work with others, how do you have to work for your fellow man? First, you have to understand your fellow man. You have to understand why they do what they do, why they think how they think. Mm -hmm. and, and can you do that unless you understand yourself? yourself? Mm -hmm. That's right. So, the first work and sacrifice is to understand why you do what you do. And then it makes more sense why they do what they do. Because they're just like you and you're just like them, essentially. We're all just people here, we're all in London, Ontario, we all have similar, very similar, objectively, circumstances around us. So to work for others, first, you work for yourself. You understand yourself, you change yourself. You, you change the vibration that you're at, you change your outlook, you, ch you change how you react to situations, and you change how others react to situations. Well, have you ever known, like, just a practical explanation, have you, have you ever seen it in a room? Everyone's in a room hanging. Let's say we're all just sitting here and we're just having a good time, we're talking. Someone comes in, in the room and they are mad. Something bad is happening to them and they are very mad and they're not talking. And they're sitting there. This changes the vibration of everybody, doesn't it? It's like, it's like ripples in a pond. What we do, what we say on a daily basis, even when we think it's not important, it matters. It has an effect on others around us. We understand ourselves, we work on ourselves, we help the others around us. See? So, this is one thing we're trying to do in phase C2, is trying to, trying to say, there's a lot of big subjects, there's a lot of big, we're talking about a lot of things that are maybe the first time ever hearing about them, but there's very practical sides to this. Very practical sides. Right? And that, and that is one thing that many people have said, and you kind of hear it, and you're like, okay, whatever, but what you say matters, it does. It does. You can affect people in ways you don't even understand. You can be mad. You can walk in, you can not even know that maybe, maybe your, 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 your child sees you mad. And then through whatever psychology of their own, they think, oh, my mom or dad is mad at me. And now they walk around and they go to school and they're bummed out because they think their parents are mad at them. So what, what we do has an effect, even if we don't see it. So, so this is a powerful room. It helps us to work with self-judgment so that we can understand the egos that are manifesting through ourselves. So we can, we can recognize the egos that are in ourselves. Those psychological aggregates, the, the eyes that we have created through time and our reactions and whatnot. So we can see how they're affecting us, how they're working through us, and we can objectively view them. Uh, one way to do this, and self, they say uh, self-observation. Okay, and self-observation, I'll just observe myself. It's, Sounds easy, easy to do, but in practicality, it seems a little difficult. Like, how do you actually self-observe? Well, it's, you have to set, you have to create 
a separation in your mind. There has to be you, the person standing there, and then what's observing it. So it would be like objectively viewing yourself. So view yourself in a situation that you're in. <coughs> so you, you see yourself in that situation, but it's more like actors on a play or you're watching a television. You're not so identified with the person who you say, oh, that's me. That's me. Right? You're viewing, what is this person doing? Don't even try not even to use the, what am I doing? What, am, what is happening to me? What is this person doing? Person A, that can be you. And then you can try to objectively observe what person A is doing as a relation to person B. This is how we start to develop the practices. This is one way that will help us. So, so these teachings are very practical, but sometimes it's, it's hard to know exactly what are the little keys and tricks to making it practical to everyday life. That's what we're going to try to give you in Phase C. Phase C is supposed to be more of the practices, more, more in-depth practices, so that you can start to verify a lot for yourself. So the practice for the Rune Vrita, for unlocking the inner judgment. You must open one leg and one arm and repeat the mantras of the Rune Vrita. Ra, re, re, ro, ru. So remorse is the accusing voice of the consciousness. Have you ever felt bad because you did something good? <laughs> right? Good point. <laughs> like, oh, geez, I shouldn't have really helped that person out who needed my help at that time. No. Remorse is the accusing voice of the conscious. You feel bad because that part of your consciousness knows that you've done something bad. You know you've done something bad. You hide it from yourself. You can cover it and say, well, it was necessary that I reacted that way. I had to. The situation called for it. They gave me no choice. Justification, justification. Have you ever justified doing something nice for yeah. someone else either? No. You only justify it and feel remorse for doing things that you deep down or some part of you knows should not have been done or weren't maybe done correctly or as good as they could have been. So we need to convert ourselves into judges of consciousness. It's basically what we've just been saying. We will, we will be our own judges. This is the room not. This is one of the rooms where this is the room we were talking about for more serious room of, for karmic negotiation. So the rune not is a very serious petition to the lords of karma, especially to the lord Anubis. We can ask for help from Anubis and his judges of karma with this rune knot, in order for them to consider negotiations. So that's the other thing to remember. You, you do this once, and then you're like, okay. In the clear, I'm afraid that's not going to... Not so, just like... You know, just like if you do the mantra, oh, for a second, you're not going to... You're not going to illuminate the heart chakra forever. You, these, these also take persistence. They take uh, focus. And they need to be done in a serious manner. And most likely, sometimes... Maybe for a month, maybe longer. Just depends on what level you're working at it with, and if if, if the law of karma will even consider the negotiation that you're asking. Because sometimes the karma, maybe it's too strong. Maybe it has to be delivered this way. Sometimes that's why we do these, and we say if it's with if, if the divine law, if it's within the divine law, we don't want to we don't want to say that do it, just do it. We want to make sure that we're still in accordance, in harmony with the divine law because maybe we need to receive this karma. Right? If you look back on your childhood or the past, you, you tend to, to learn a lot or take a lot away a lot from the situations that we feel are, are the most painful or, or the ones where we feel wronged or we feel this negative. So, and for working with the sacrifice, we know that when we receive karma, it doesn't, it doesn't feel pleasant for us, right? We don't, we don't enjoy receiving this karma. That also helps us to work for the fellow man. Because we know when they're receiving karma, it doesn't, because we know how it feels when we receive it. So now we can, we can sympathize with others. We can put ourselves in others' place, which is, which is part of the work and sacrifice. You want to work with sacrifice tomorrow? Just something easy? Put yourself in someone else's shoes. Try to view it as they're viewing it. You know, try to connect a little bit with your common man. Don't see yourself so separated from everybody. 
They're receiving karma. They're going through trials. We're receiving karma. We're going through trials. Yes? How do you know if um, the bargain you've made with the judges is reasonable? Like, maybe quitting smoking isn't enough for yeah. what you're asking? And right. how do you know? And if you don't smoke, what could you offer them? All right. Well, uh, you, like... <laughs> It's been taught in these classes. Something else that's difficult. Yeah, something that's something difficult for you, difficult. or sometimes a sacrifice that would be for your inner being. Like if you would say, "Oh, I, I really need this to happen. If you make this happen, I will. I will swear I'll find five minutes a day, every day, to meditate or to do a practice." You usually internally you might have some idea of something that because you, you you know of stuff. Well, maybe I'll just tell them. You know, hey, hey, if. Uh, if you give me this karma, I just, I know I won't drink that much. But you don't, you already don't drink that much. So you know internally yeah. if it's going to be easy for you or yeah, if it's well, going no, to be. No, you can't uh, kind of cheat them. They, they no. know, but that's yeah. Just no, I, no, I understand what you're questioning. Yeah, because I, I be, thought that too. Yeah. That would be sort of on the same level, mm -hmm. it's like the balance, I guess. Yeah. Right. It could be something that you find to be a, a hindrance to, like this kind of work, like say you're really involved in, I don't know, like, what it says an example, like Gossip Magazine. Oh, oh right. Oh, and we'll give or get off magazine. the internet or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> I won't <laughs> talk chat bad about people behind their backs. Get out of the chat room. Yeah. There, there, there's so much that we can oh, okay. offer that would yeah. better our, our spiritual existence that they might, yes? You could also offer to spread the knowledge, yep. the gnosis to yep. others. That's okay. another way to sacrifice. To work, for, work in the sacrifice for mm -hmm. others. That and works very, very well. Yep. You can tell a friend about these classes. Oh, you should check out these meditation classes or whatnot. Or you could even give them a book that you feel has helped you. Something like this. There's, there's many ways. If we sit down and we think and maybe you can focus on your heart, that can help you to come up with something. But it, it is important that before we do this that we do seriously think about it and we, we realize, okay, they tell us a lot of stuff, they say it's very serious, so should, should this one just be jumped into and just done? M maybe not. I mean, there, there are Gnostic members here who have stated that they've used it and they were, they were unable to keep their end and that the karma that they received was it's very harsh that they felt or was painful for them. Uh, was real, which is important to keep in mind, but it, it's a tool and we can use it. So, so I'm not trying to scare people off of using it, I'm just letting you know that, like many other things in the work, it, it is real and it's serious and it should be considered and taken seriously as such. But how do they know that karma was the consequence of not keeping up their end of the bargain? How do they know that wasn't just karma they were supposed to receive anyway? And yeah. they had negotiated a different karma? Like, mm -hmm. how can you tell which, like, if I get a flat tire tomorrow, is yeah. that karma? Like, <laughs> or is it I just a test, or is it just yeah. a flat tire? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> this is difficult. Yep. So we start working with some of these practices. We start raising our consciousness. And these, sometimes something will happen, and it'll be very minor. Like, no, something in me knows that that is a test. And I'm being tested right now. And it depends how you react to it. I mean, yep. you just blow it off and say, well, exactly. that's just not a, nothing to the worst things in the world. Yep. Yeah. Yep. This is true. So, just like, like everything that we're teaching here, it's, it's kind of a, a you, you take it internal. It's internal for you to discover, for you to figure out, which does ultimately sound like a cop-out. Like, they we're not giving you the information. Like, well, you'll know. How do you know? Oh, well, I'll tell you, Wanda, you'll just know. <laughs> right? But at the same time, like, we could stand up here and say, like, towards someone who's never experienced, like, a national projection experience consciously, we could say, it exists. This is what it feels like. This is what happens. This is blah, blah, blah. Like, we've seen this and this and this here. But if you haven't experienced it yourself, you, to you it still is it's in the realm of intellectualism. Well, maybe it's true. He certainly seems to think it's true, but I don't know. So that is the difficulty of this path, which is different from many other teachings and many other, a lot of, there's some new age movements where it's like, no, you're already divine, you're already a god, just wait it out and you'll be fine. <laughs> this one says, no, where does the buck stop? It stops with you, you do the work, and you can verify things for yourself. You verify <laughs> things, then you gather strength and you can say, I can move on, I can do this. So karma, karma is, 
it is tricky to explain to some to other people. It's tricky to know how to explain like how will I know if it, this is karma. It, it is one of those areas in Gnosticism, not even in Gnosticism, just in general, that you will get a lot out of if, if you dive deeper into it yourself. Instead of just hearing a lecture here and a lecture there, you can study it in Samael's books or books from the East where they are well versed in karma. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those where if you study it for study it deeper, you can get a lot out of it. This rune also has another ability mm -hmm. to negotiate karma or to assist us in remembering our previous lives, mm -hmm. which will help yeah, us in right karma. <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. ex if we can examine our previous lives, we can understand maybe why are we receiving certain karmic situations in our life now. So, this version of the practice might be a good place to start with this room. So we must not complain because of karma since it is negotiable. Whosoever has capital from good deeds can pay without the necessity of suffering. So if, you're, if karma is coming to you because you were in a bar and you got drunk and you got angry and you fought somebody, and now you have to pay a karmic debt for that. If, if you would analyze yourself, well, why why was I so angry? Why did I fight? Why did I feel the need to be in this, to get drunk and angry and let all these, and you analyze it and you comprehend it and you meditate on it and you eliminate those egos, your karmic, there would be, there would be no point for this karma to hit you. Because it's trying to teach you a lesson. It's trying to balance your life. If you're showing a lot of aggression is trying to balance and show you maybe maybe aggression isn't the best thing. And how does it show you? Maybe you're the, on the receiving end of a beating or something like something equal to the situation but opposite in, uh, in effect. So eliminate the ego. You eliminate the need to be karmically reprimanded for that. So practice one for the rune knot. The practices of the rune knot take us to the performing of pranayama. That is to say, to the wise and intelligent combination of solar and lunar atoms. Afterwards, the Gnostic student must sit down or lay down with his back facing upwards. With his body relaxed, he must concentrate and try to remember his past lives. We perform the rune knot. While we do it, we breathe in rhythmically through the nose, hold it out through the mouth, the that prana, not the alternate nose prana, more like the complete breath. And then we lie down. How can we remember our, our past lives? One place starts that we can visualize the master and do this. We can try and picture him, picture this jackal-headed god. It, it will help. And then we can try and focus on, ask our divine mother to intercede on our behalf to the Lord at Anubis to help us to remember our past lives. So that, that's the first practice. Practice two. So we form the room by placing one arm at an angle of 135 degrees. <laughs> it just means up. <laughs> just like this. Right? Like across. So then the arm which is forming the uh, basically instead of saying this the angles, you're gonna sit, you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna alternate the position of each arm. That's all this is saying. During this exercise you must chant the mantras na ne ni no nu while concentrating on Anubis, the chief of karma. In this manner, ask him for the, nego the, the negotiation you wish, and ask him for the help urgently needed. Yes. Was it only the Egyptians that had a, uh, a figure who represented the lord of karma? No, I know that the Hindus, the Buddhists, they do. I'm not as familiar with them. But for the Egyptians, it was a very concrete figure. Anubis was karma. All right. In... Uh, this region, I think it's fair to say it's predominantly Christian. There's no Christian figure that would represent, that we could picture in our mind and say, oh yeah, oh, that's the saint of karma. Right? We don't really have one. So why do we use Anubis? This is a concrete deity that was solely to represent karma. So, yeah. But there was in the Greek mythology yeah. Nemesis. Yeah, there was. Which was like goddess of karma too. And that is true. So that, yeah, there, there was in other traditions there was a, there was a figure that represented karma um, around like in Christianity not so much some other they're, they're more like like you said Greek mythology but also the Eastern traditions all Hinduism Buddhism they, they talk about karma quite a bit but for us 
we might be slightly familiar with the Egyptian figure because it seems like in this part of the world we have we have a knowledge of Egypt. We think it was neat looking. They have all these cool artistic pictures. They have lots of art depicting Anubis. The most famous picture, the one that helps us a lot, is there's a picture of Anubis weighing the heart. So that's the, the judgment of the karma. So that's why we use Anubis. He's the symbol. He's a symbol that we can recognize that is that represents that force, that that, that cosmic force that is karma. Because we can view these however we want. We, we, we can view them as is it a is it a, a deity? Is it a separate deity? It it can be. It, it can present itself that way in like the astral plane or something like that. But ultimately it's a principle. There, these are all principles and forces that exist. Energy. Everything is energy, right? So science teaches us. Everything is energy. The rune laugh. With the rune laugh, we make a petition for help to our inner being and to the masters of the White Lodge. Practice. The corresponding practice of this rune consists of facing the sun in the morning and at the moment it rises in the east. With a mystical attitude, raise the hands as shown in the picture and implore esoteric help. Hands out with the palms up as like you're receiving, you're receiving help. This practice should be done on the 27th of each month. So th this practice here does correspond to a specific date, 27th of each month. That's when the forces are the strongest for this, yes. Is that some, some sort of numerological thing, or is it... Well, two, two and seven, yeah, they do equal uh, nine, so it's like a symbol of the work in alchemy, it can be. There, there are other reasons why the 27th is important that will become clear to you when you progress to uh, pre-chamber and second chamber. I don't know if you have you ever had a class scheduled for a 27th before in phase A, B, or C. If you did, we were canceled. canceled. We yeah. canceled, because we have... It's a special. It's a it's a day that has specific forces that we utilize in second chamber practices. But we don't have to be in second chamber to utilize these forces. We can utilize them in our own house. It's just asking the petition. Help me. Help me in my work. Help me to know what am I supposed to be doing. Show me how to make these practices work for me. Divine Mother, help me to hear your voice. Anything that we wish. Esoteric help. And that's that.